Hello everyone, this is David Saffer. I'm a photographer and printmaker. I live just outside of Los Angeles and I'll be your host today for Introduction to Color Management for Photographers for September 2012. Uh, normally my associate David Toby would be joining us uh, for the introduction, but he is at Photokina in Germany, in Cologne, Germany, and so he can't be with us today. So a uh, distant hello to David Toby, and we're going to get started now with the session. We're going to talk about color management for photographers, and we're going to talk about it from a practical point of view. What I want to do is go over the technology that Data Color has to offer. Of course, they're the sponsor. I'd like to go over the technology that Data Color has to offer in this area, but I also want to show you some of the nuance and some of the leverage points that you can use to get the best results and really make your images sparkle um, when you're working on them. Most photographers feel they have only limited control over color management, and that's really not the case. It's, it's something of a, I wouldn't call it a fear factor, but definitely an intimidation factor because in the past, the technology has been not so easy to use. You know, if, if three or four years ago, was okay, but it's nowhere near the level of, of ease of use and user friendliness and a good interface that we have now with the current uh, line of products and devices. You can greatly improve accuracy and consistency with uh, devices like the Spider 4, which is the display calibrator, the Spider Cube, the Spider Checker, and Spider Print. And some of the examples of the things that you can control and manipulate and otherwise um, use to your advantage are exposure, control of your white and black point, um, color profiling, color balance, better efficiency in post-production, um, focus control, and more. Now I did forget to mention um, about something about questions during the session. During the session we're going to have a couple of polls. I appreciate if you help us out with the answers for that. But you can also ask questions. Uh, I will try to catch the questions as they go by on the panel that I see on my screen um, during the session and at least answer some of, some of them. And then I will stay online for 15 or 20 minutes afterwards to answer questions. And I'll also give you an email address that you can send questions to um, after the session is over. Now in a color managed workflow, you know, the, the classic answer is proper color management gives you consistent color throughout your digital workflow. And what I'd like to see is that you develop the confidence that you can make your images sparkle from start to finish. Now our first poll question is pretty straightforward. We'd like to know what your involvement in photography is. Could you please tell us if you're a beginner or an advanced amateur, a part-time pro or a full-time pro? and I'm just waiting for the answers to come over. Let's see. We have 5% beginners, 58% advanced amateurs, 28% uh, part-time pros, and 9% full-time pros. Thank you. Okay, so continuing on. Here's a little tip for you from the beginning of setting up or the setup for Photoshop, and this really applies to almost any Photoshop version that people might be using. Photoshop isn't really set up for color management when it comes out of the box or comes on the download. And in particular, in the color settings panel, never mind the preferences uh, panels, but in the color settings panel, you'll see the first thing that happens if you watch my cursor on the screen is that there'll be a button on the lower right under the cancel load save setup. You'll see it says more options and half the panel you see here is not going to show until you click on that button that says more options. And your working space typically is going to show up and it's going to say North American web coded swap or some other designation that's really reserved for four color press, newspapers, magazines, that sort of thing, and certainly doesn't have a whole lot to do with the kind of photography that we're interested in. 
So what I'd like you to consider doing is changing the RGB working space to either Adobe 98 or Profoto RGB. Adobe 98 is a reasonably big color space. It's the place where most printer manufacturers are striving to you know, get their printer output to, you know, to, uh, to produce. And Profoto RGB is uh, quite a bit bigger. It was originally intended for scanning film, but I also find it's quite useful in certain images, high contrast, high color saturation, that kind of thing. And you can leave the rest of these drop downs al alone as far as working spaces go. But in color management policies, you really want to change these to preserve embedded profiles and ask when opening or ask when pasting. And here's the reason. If you have an image, perhaps one that you produced uh, some time ago or one that you've been given to work on, you don't really know what that color space is until you open it in Photoshop. And when you open it in Photoshop and these settings are in place, you're going to get a notification dialog that says, do you really want to do this? Do you want to keep this embedded color space or do you want to convert it to the working color space? And that's important because you want to know what you're working on. You want to know if you're working on a constrained color space like sRGB, or if you're working in the color space that you normally work in, for example, Adobe 98. And that's a very, very useful thing. And Photoshop won't do that for you unless you enable it. The conversion options, uh, typically Adobe Ace, perceptual or saturation. Some people also use uh, relative colorimetric or absolute colorimetric, depending on what kind of work they're doing, but I normally use perceptual for photography. And the other ones, are, I believe, are defaults, and you can leave them as is. Now, what we're working on, actually, is expanded capabilities. We want to help you improve your on-screen image quality, accuracy, and consistency. We want to help you get a good screen-to-print match. I don't want to see people in a position where they're working so hard that they're making a print, bringing it back to the screen, adjusting in Photoshop, making another print, basically print, tweak, print, tweak. That's a waste of time and money. We want to expand ease of use, make that as easy to use across the board, give you top flexibility, and give you real power for, you, for professionals, the kind that you know, really makes your images sparkle from start to finish. So let's start with display calibration. Display calibration is, is, in a way, your primary point of contact, your primary interface with everything that's going on inside your computer and what's going to happen downstream. Once you've got that digital image going, this is the playing field. And these devices come out of the box. They're not really set up for photography. They're too bright and they're too blue. They're very bright. They're, they're intended to be used, at least in the minds of the manufacturers and engineers that are shipping them out the door. They're intended to be used in a brightly lit office environment. Um, many people that are designing these things are thinking word processing and email, not photography. And so the, the, the default settings on a lot of these displays are just not going to serve you well. If they're too bright, for example, they're going to kill your highlight detail and misrepresent your shadow detail. So what we're going to do in calibrating the display is get the luminance and the color under control. Now, when you plug in your Spider 4, excuse me, I'm going to take a sip of water. When you plug in your Spider 4, um, typically what will happen on the first pass is the first two questions here, or the first two check boxes, are going to be grayed out. Recalibration and check calibration will be grayed out. It'll want you to do a full calibration on the first pass. In subsequent calibrations, you can recalibrate, which will take less time. Okay, or you can check the calibration in case you suspect that something has gone wrong. And of course, you have down, down here, you have drop downs. These are multiple choice drop downs. If you click on them, you get menus that drop down, just like many things in software nowadays, for gamma, white point, and brightness. Now, the gamma I'd like to see you use is gamma 2.2 to start with, and a white point of 6,500, and a brightness of about 120. Now, 120 is a little bit 
less bright than what most people are used to, you're going to find that when you set it to 120, it's going to take you a couple of days to get used to it. But at 120, you're within striking distance of a good screen to print match. And, and here's the hitch. Most people who come to me and say, gee whiz, I, I've got a print and it's just too dark. And the, you know, or they'll say, my color is all wrong. And I'll ask them, well, what exactly is wrong? And they'll say, well, exactly, the print is darker than the screen. And that's because the screen brightness is cranked up, say, to 180 or 200. Get the ambient light in your room down to a reasonable level so that the screen at 120 is the brightest thing in the room. And I think you'll see with a little bit of practice that you'll get a much better match between screen and print. Now during calibration, uh, you see the patches on the lower left. Those are going to be displayed on the screen. Uh, you can see the Spider 4 uh, in the field being used in the studio where the camera is going to be tethered to the, to the display. And right, the, if one pushes the next button on this screen right here, it would start showing us these different color panels. And it's going to manage, measure, not manage, measure each color panel and decide whether that color panel is within limits or not, whether it's the right color or the wrong color. Now, if it's the wrong color, if it's off just by a little bit, it's going to take note of that and measure it and save those results in what one might call a lookup table. And it's going to save that table. Every time you start your computer, it's going to correct your screen to that color standard. So every time that you sit down at your computer, you're looking at a color corrected screen. Over a period of time, say a month, the display will drift slightly, and it'll be time for you to do a recal. And I normally do my screen calibrations on the first of the month, just so I'll remember. So in any event, that's how it works. You can use the Spider 4 Elite, for example, um, to help you set the brightness of your screen. And this one I set up to deliberately show a pretty low value in a darkened room at 90 and a white point of 5,000. Now, those aren't necessarily suggested settings. They're just an example of how far you can go. That white point of 5,000 will look pretty yellow to you, and the 90 will look pretty dark. Um, I personally don't normally use the ambient light control. I like to keep the room lights under control and um, not use this. Keep it at, keep my uh, screen brightness at about 110 to 120 and work with it like that on a consistent basis. Now I included this image because I wanted to show you an example of a, a less than ideal setup. Here you have a, a nice laptop and a nice display, et cetera, et cetera, and a beautiful office. But there's a big problem. Um, there's actually a couple. One of them is, is that there's a giant bright window. And it has blinds on it, but they're, they're just everyday blinds. They're not really doing that much good. And the blinds are clearly very bright, particularly in the, in the morning here where the sunlight is coming uh, right in through the window. And that's going to force you to increase the screen brightness so you can see the darn thing. And then what's going to happen? Your highlight and shadow detail are going to be affected by that. If the screen is too bright, your highlight detail, you're going to show blown out details uh, pretty early in the game. And your shadows are going to show you things that probably are not going to exist in your print. And of course, your print is going to look darker than the screen. So what you really want to do is be in a room where that kind of window is covered, the overhead lights are turned off, and maybe you have a small lamp behind you and off to the left or right and that is not shining light directly on your screen so that you can um, really, un really control the brightness of the screen down to about the 120 level and see things as they really are. Now, when the calibration is complete, there's a number of tests and reports that the Spider 4 software will give you. Uh, this is just one example. And if you look at the red outline, that's showing you the color palette or the color gamut that is present for the display that's in use. And this happens to be an HP Dream Color. It's a 24-inch uh, wide gamut display. Okay, and then down below here you see Adobe 98 is purple. That's Adobe 98. So this particular display, which is a very nice one, gives you at least 100% of Adobe 98. And, 
and put you in a good position to get a good screen to print match. Also, in far, as far as calibration goes, there's another tool called the Spider Proof. Spider Proof lets you do a before and after comparison. You can see that there are many different types of images in these panels, and the, and the, and the example of the screenshot on the upper left shows you the after, the calibrated view. The one on the lower right shows you the uncalibrated view. Now, just for the sake of our discussion, if you look at the church here where my cursor is, for example, the blues, basically all the colors in the image or the picture of the garden are just not the greatest. And then if you come up here to the calibrated view, you can see that they're much more highly saturated, much more intense. You see better gradations in the sky. Um, you see good shadow to highlight transitions in the flower pots and that sort of thing. And of course, um, you know, it, it's, really, it's really quite a positive change. Uh, and it's to your advantage to be able to see these details and to really see the colors as they will be produced by your output device. Now, you can also, in these panels, if I clicked on this set of four, for example, you can see where the red outline is here. This would pop up and fill the whole screen. And you can see more details. And then if you click on any one of these images, they would pop up and fill the whole screen. So you can look at different types of images, some um, low saturation portraits, uh, black and white um, still life or portraits, that kind of thing. There's a whole range of color still life and other things, landscapes. You can look at these and decide which ones are closest to the work that you intend to be doing and decide whether or not you've achieved your goal in getting the screen to be representative of the color, saturation, and luminance that you want. Another tool that's available to you in this software, which is extremely useful, particularly if you happen to use a laptop and a desktop machine, is a tool called SpiderTune. And SpiderTune is intended to help you fine tune the color in the profile so that, for example, you could match two screens side by side. Let's say I had my MacBook Pro next to my desktop screen, and the MacBook Pro having, in generally speaking, a more limited color gamut might, be a little, might look a little bit different, might be a little off as compared to the desktop device. And so what I can do is, is calibrate the laptop and use this screen to dial it in and get them to match instead of, say, at 95 or 97 percent, at 98 or 99 percent levels, so that I get them as close as they can be. Now, here's a little tip for you, and I'm sure most of you know this. Laptops have what's called a narrower field of view, in, in that if you move your head from side to side when you're looking at a laptop, or up and down, that the color and apparent density of the image that you're seeing will change. Now, what to do about that? Well, the only thing you really can do is to try and keep your point of vision in the center of the screen, in the sweet spot. That's a little bit fatiguing. That's why it's a little bit harder to edit images on a laptop, among other things. But at least with Spider SpiderTune, you can get that laptop to be pretty much representative of what you're going to see on your desktop machine. Now, there's also a software app or application called Spider Gallery that lets you uh, calibrate your iPad and your iPhone. And I'm going to go through this briefly. I just want you to understand that the color that's shown in the iPad and the iPhone is uh, the iPad 1 and the iPad 2, at least, and, and I think the iPad 3. Um, they're not really sRGB devices. They're in the neighborhood, but they're pretty much Apple RGB, whatever that means. And Apple's not really saying. And the brilliant engineers at Datacolor have developed a system that will help you calibrate that color space to something a little bit closer to standard sRGB, which means the phone and the iPad are going to look pretty similar once they're calibrated. And be a very useful tool, for example, in showing images to clients and customers, uh, something I happen to do all the time. The system setup is pretty straightforward. You're going to need a wireless network, 
and you take your laptop or your desktop machine and you plug your spider into that and you place it on top of the iPad or the iPhone. You're going to select the same network for both of them so they can be talking to each other over the network and the spider is going to talk back to the host computer via the USB cable. And at this point it's very similar to calibrating your display uh, you place the colorimeter where you're sh inside the outline, as shown here on this slide. And when it's done, uh, it will direct you to go to the viewer, and voila, you will see your images in all their glory. Now, I admit freely that this was composited in Photoshop. I did this to show you a comparison before and after without having to switch screens. So on the left, you can see the uncalibrated display looks very nice. Um, there's reasonable detail in the flowers, reasonable detail in color in the eyes, for example, et cetera, et cetera. But it's just average. And when you go over to the spider gallery view, the calibrated view, you can see much improved contrast in the eyes, the eyelashes, more detail in the hair, much more detail in the highly saturated flowers. And so this is a very, very useful tool for those of us who want to show our images to people on an iPad or an iPhone. Okay, let's do our next poll. I want to know if you're calibrating your display at all. Um, I know there are many people who don't do it currently. Um, some are thinking about it, considering. Some do it once or twice a year, and some do it once a month or every other month. So let's see how that turns out. Okay, here we go. Now that's interesting. Um, we did the we did a, a a webinar that was a little bit similar to this about six months ago, and we had a much higher percentage of people that said they were not calibrating, and a much higher percentage of people said they were considering it. And by far the majority in this poll are doing it once a month or every other month. And I congratulate you. That that really puts you in the driver's seat. Um, and I hope you continue to do that. That's, that's the way to keep your color locked down and to keep your work under control and get the results that you want. In other words, to get your image to sparkle from start to finish. Let's talk a little bit about the Spider Cube. The Spider Cube is a color management device developed by Data Color. It's exclusive to the company. Um, and it's really one of those widgets, if you want to call it that, or devices, that's brilliant in design. It's a very simple adaptation of a, a number of other tools all rolled into one package. And one might think, well, it's got a gray area on it, so it's just like a gray card. It's far more than a gray card. It's a multi-purpose device. It can help you set your camera meter. It can help you um, set your in-camera white balance. It's very useful when shooting tethered and in post-production, and it can be used in studio and location work. Now, you can use it. I'm going to just go through this step by step. You can use the Spider Cube to set your in-camera custom white balance. Now, exactly how you do this changes from manufacturer to manufacturer, and even within manufacturers, from camera to camera. But you set the Spider Cube in the shot with your lighting and fill the frame with the cube as much as you can and set that custom white balance. Now, why do you want to do that? Why not just set it to the presets on the camera? If you set the custom white balance, it's going to adjust that preview that you see on the back of your camera. It's, that preview is a semi-processed JPEG. It's not your RAW file. And so what's going to happen, first of all, is color and density generally will improve. And your white clipping view, what some people call the blinkies, will be more accurate. Now let's talk about the blinkies for a second. The blinkies are areas of that it is where the camera is trying to show you that you've overexposed your image. So for example, something bright in frame that is blinking on and off in your LCD is trying to tell you that that area is not going to show a lot or is not going to show any detail at all uh, when you go to edit or print it. 
The only place that you should see the blinkies on the spider cube is on the chrome ball. Okay, not on the gray areas, absolutely, and not on the white areas. If the white areas are blinking, you're definitely overexposed. So you just want to see them on that chrome ball. That's what it's for. That's going to show you that you're in the neighborhood. And if the white areas aren't blinking, you're doing pretty well. The black area is going to show you the bottom end of your zones. And you can see here that there is a flat area. Watch the cursor. Okay. And then there's a hole, which we call the black trap. The black trap is going to be absolutely black. Now, you do want to see um, a distinction between the black flat and the black trap. If you can't see that black circle, you're probably underexposed. If you can't see that on your LCD, you probably want to up your exposure a little bit. So you can couple this with what your camera meter is telling you or your handheld meter is telling you and dial in your exposure. Now normally when I'm doing this, I typically will switch to manual exposure for the rest of the shoot unless I have light that's changing. I'm going to dial it in using the meters that I have in the spider cube and I'm going to set it on manual exposure and fire away. Now I know this top right picture is an eye test. I apologize for that. It was the only way I could give you a reminder or a schematic of each one of these uh, facets of the device and what they do. At the top you see the chrome ball as a specular highlight. That's what it's for. And note that this is being sort of a pyramid shaped device that one side is brighter than the other. And that lets you use this, for example, to measure your key light or your, your main light or your secondary light. So you can see it's labeled primary light, so light source card gray on the right, and on the left, primary light source card gray, secondary, excuse me, light source card gray. And all the way down the left, secondary, and on the right, primary. And then, of course, you have your black card or black face and your black trap, or the black hole, as some people call it, um, to help you gauge your exposure on your first or subsequent shots. Now you can see down below that the spider cube is placed um, adjacent uh, to the object being photographed. It's in the same lighting, of course. Now this particular picture was taken with the modeling lights on. This is not an actual shot with the strobes firing. So you're going to see some differences here than you would see in the actual shot. Now let's just flip over to Lightroom 4 very briefly and I'm going to show you how this works in real life and how you can get color control uh, very quickly um, using just one aspect of the spider cube. Now you can't really see it yet but there's a spider cube nestled on this bed and I realize that this is an image, um, if some of you have attended some of these webinars in the past, this is an image you've seen in the past, but I like this image because it uses really horrible mixed lighting. <laughs> and, and if any of us have ever been in this situation, um, you'll understand why I did this. Mixed lighting is the biggest headache in post-production I can think of, other than simply a bad photograph, in that you have different lighting spectra, different, um, different color temperatures coming at you from different directions. It's very difficult to color balance something like this without a device like the Spider Cube. And right here in this red square, you can see our color eyedropper, which is going to help us adjust. And of course, we're in the develop module, right? And here's our histogram up above in the other red square. Let's go to the next panel. And zooming in, we're going to take that eyedropper and we're going to click on the gray area that's lit the brightest and this happens to be the, the one that's on the right just by a slight margin. And when we do that we're going to get color correction that looks like this. I kid you not. It's that good. Um, it's, these are made out of a very, very durable polymer. Um, you can scratch them and mistreat them and all you have to do is wash them off and you can use them again and again and again. And so the spider cube has taken what's almost an impossible situation and really dialed in the color for us. Very simple, very straightforward. Um, I'm going to show you more in a minute. Now take note that in this photograph there are some areas that are very bright, can't be helped. The photographer who took this picture had to decide between showing some of the shadows, for example, in these corners, et cetera, et cetera, 
or showing some of the detail and the highlights in the lamps. And quite rightful, I think, they decided to pick an exposure that would let the detail on the lamps go a little bit, but show you the detail in the corners of the room, the shadows, and the lower midtones. Also take note that some of the light coming from the hallway, which is from a different light source, is also looking quite good. Now, in ACR, Adobe Camera Raw 7, it's pretty much the same deal. We've got the spider cube sitting on the bed, and we're going to go up here, and we're going to get that white or gray eyedropper, and we're going to click in the appropriate area. And, of course, it's going to adjust the image for us. Now, let me just think about this a second. Bear with me, I'm going to flip forward a couple of slides here. I want to look at something. Yes, there it is. Okay, I didn't leave it out. Okay, now the spider checker is a really nice complement to the spider cube. It's a really useful color management tool. It has a rigid body. You can see it's sort of a clamshell. And inside the clamshell are removable color panels. And these can be flipped over to show you gray panels as well. And I'll reveal that to you in a minute. It's tripod mountable. It has a tripod mount, and you can mount the spider cube at the top. Um, you can also simply stand it up where you need it. It is shipped with a camera calibration software, which is standalone, and it can also be used with Lightroom, Photoshop, and Hasselblad Focus, which is unique. Um, just to get a little bit descriptive on you, the right side has 24 patches. Uh, they are near or within the sRGB color space. On the left side, there's six additional skin tones for a total of eight, which is very useful in color matching and post-production. The left side also has six medium saturated colors to improve the overall color gamut coverage. There are three white tints and three near black tones. There's a gray ramp that increased to 10% steps, and there's extra 5 and 95% samples. Now, one thing that's on here that's a little bit hard to see, I probably need to enlarge this photograph, is there's what's called a fade checker. Now, all of these um, you know, checkerboard products, if you want to call them that, fade over time. They get scratched. People do th bad things to them. They get left outside, et cetera, et cetera. Anything imaginable, anything you can imagine has happened to the ones that I own. People just do things to them. And these panels are replaceable. Instead of having to buy the whole unit, you can simply slide out a panel that's no longer um, up to speed and put a new one in. And the fader tells you when they faded. When they fade, of course, they're not going to give you the best result when the software is reading these patches in, in, your, in your image file. So, like I said, unlike some other products that are available, you can replace these panels, one or both, and keep this thing operating at top efficiency. Now, the way the, this workflow uh, proceeds is you install the software from the disk and you capture an image of the spider checker. Proper lighting is important. Um, typically, a light that's, say, at 12 o'clock over the camera, something like a, model, a light you'd use to shoot a model that gives you very flat, very even lighting, corner to corner and top to bottom. What you don't want to see is shadows in the corners. Okay, you don't want to see reflections. You don't want to see bright spots. Um, Every once in a while, I see a picture where somebody has turned the darn thing upside down, and this magenta patch is up in the upper right-hand corner. Just keep it mind that that magenta patch belongs in the lower left. It should also say spider checker right side up, of course. But in any event, you want to keep this thing right side up so the software can read it correctly. Once you've shot this in your camera at the correct exposure, you're going to normalize the image. You're going to, you're going to edit it in Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw or Focus, and you're going to open the image in the Spider Checker application. And you're going to export that preset to your image editing software. Now, here's an example of how you can normalize your picture of the Spider Checker. Interesting thing here. In Camera Raw, you not only have a white or gray dropper, but you also have a color dropper. And you can use that. I've enlarged this here so you can see it better. The dropper with the little X next to it, or the little cross next to it, you can drop sampling circles into different panels. That was a mistake on my part. 
so you can do it in this white panel, in this gray panel, and the black panel. And you can drop them, and there's one, two, and three, and you see in the readout you're going to get results for dropper one, two, and three. And you're going to take your controls, much improved in Adobe Camera Raw 7, you're going to take your controls, and you're going to make adjustments so that each one of these has an even set of numbers, 10, 10, and 10, 120 throughout, 233 or 230 throughout. And you can see they're off, there's one of them is off by one number, so that doesn't really matter. But you want to get these all into these ranges so that when you export this and the spider checker software processes it, you get a correct result. Now, when you import this into Spider Checker, you'll see that there are sampling squares that line up in each patch. That's very useful because you want to be in the sweet spot. You don't want to be near the edge where the color of the border might affect the results. You want to be right in the middle. You can drag any edge or corner of this image to fit into this pattern. You can see there's handles, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I just lost my place. Save calibration. You can use the Save Calibration button to save your calibration to your chosen application. So you can, for example, save it to Lightroom or save it to Adobe Camera Raw. Here's your button. You can use um, different rendering intents. Typically, people use colorimetric for artwork or product. Uh, there's a portrait reduces skin tone saturation slightly, and saturation is any time you want a color boost. Um, landscape photography comes to mind. A still life with brightly colored flowers, those sorts of things. Now, what the heck just happened? I hit the wrong button. Pardon me. This will give everybody vertigo, I'm sure. And a one, and a two, and a three. Okay, I apologize for that. Now, on the upper left here, you can see there's some poor person actually turned the thing upside down and took a picture of it, and that is not going to work. Um, you can try, but it won't. It's expecting those colors to be in certain positions on the grid. The presets are going to show up in your user presets, for example, in Lightroom. Um, this is one that David Toby did on his uh, 5D Mark II. And, of course, in Adobe Camera Raw, you can load those settings here. And if you click on Load Settings, you'll see that same file come up, and you can click on it. That will be applied to the image that you are working on at the time. And for those of us who are intimately familiar with Camera Raw, uh, you can open more than one image at a time from a shoot in Camera Raw and synchronize the application of those color corrections to all the images in that folder. Now the spider checker also has a reverse face. Uh, if you're working in black and white or, for example, you simply want to um, white balance your camera, you can flip those color panels around in the holder and photograph them in the same way that we talked about before. These patches consist of the same gray ramp as the color face on the target in 10% steps. And the large gray patches are set to the 50% level. Very, very useful. You can use this for validating display neutrality. For example, if you took a photograph of this and you showed this on your display, the human eye is remarkably good at picking up a color cast in a gray field. So right now, I'm looking at this on my color calibrated display, and this looks absolutely gray to me. There is no color tint whatsoever. If there was, you would see it right away. Um, it's one of the things that the eye and brain pick up on remarkably quickly. And so that will tip you off. Maybe you need to recalibrate your display, or there may have been something that went wrong when you were shooting this thing to begin with. Nine times out of 10, you won't see any problem at all if you've been calibrating and doing your homework. If you do the quick in-camera balance, again, you'll be ensuring that your initial view of images on your LCD is optimized, uh, particularly if you're going to be shooting to generate JPEGs or you're using your LCD to check image quality while you're shooting. Another tip here is if you do shoot this side of the device, check the corners and the edges and the middle and the top and the bottom 
for lighting intensity and evenness. And one way to do that, I'm going to back up a little bit, is you can take that same dropper and if you hover over, and please just try to imagine that we're working with the gray panel here, if you hover over any area of this, you're going to see those RGB numbers up here. And if they vary significantly from one corner to another, it would be a good idea to reshoot it, adjust your lighting and reshoot it until they are even. Now let's talk a little bit about printer profiles. Here's one of the next steps. And that, and I want to talk about, it's sort of a pet peeve of mine. I'm a printmaker, I'm a professional printmaker. In fact, I've got a couple of jobs waiting for me this afternoon that I have to finish before I leave town. And the thing is, is that the manufacturers work really, really hard on making these printers stable and consistent over time. And they provide us with pretty decent what we call printer managed color which is a small computer inside the printer that will manage the color that's sent to it as best it can. But you have to keep in mind that that brain is the size of a pea at best and it has limited capability. It can only do so much to manage your color. Now if you have a non-manufacturer paper or a specialty paper or you have a particularly challenging image, that printer managed color isn't going to get the job done. So what do you do? Most of us already know that you would switch to application or Photoshop managed color or Lightroom managed color and use a paper profile. And that works pretty darn well, but there's also an issue there. Here's what it is. When they make those profiles, they're creating an average of the machines coming off the factory line. It's not specific to your printer on your desk or your stand in your studio. I'll say that again. It's an average. It's not specific to your printer. Every printer has its own fingerprint. It's, it exists in a unique environment of humidity and temperature, um, air pollution, you name it it's coping with a whole different set of factors than the one that's in that nice clean room in the factory uh, either here in the United States or overseas. And the one that's sitting on your desk, since it has its own fingerprint, in my view, if you're making really nice prints and you're spending all this time and money on paper, you really want to make a custom profile for it. And I'll tell you a quick story. A friend of mine was working with um, a very nice 17 inch wide pro level printer and getting some very nice prints out of it. He had some photographs last year from Aspen, Colorado. And the detail in the highly saturated yellow leaves of the Aspen trees wasn't quite there. It was good, but it wasn't quite there. You couldn't see every detail. And this is a man who's using a 4x5 camera and having his film scanned. He wants to see the detail. So we made a profile using spider print and voila, all the detail in the highlight areas came up another 10 or 15 percent. It was a transformation that really knocked his socks off. And that's a true story. And so ever since then, he's been making his own profiles for the papers that he buys for his fine art prints. Now, when you start off with spider print, clearly you're going to plug the device in and you're going to fire up the software, which is you've installed, and you're going to see two screens. Now, you can certainly go through the learn about color management process, but we're going to stick to profiling your printer for the moment. And you're going to create a printer profile to accurately reproduce colors on your printer. So one of the screens that's going to come up is going to be profiling and print your target. And there's four choices here. The first choice is uh, the high quality target, sometimes called the easy high quality target, although you know, I think that sort of demeans its effectiveness. And it's 225 patches on two sheets. And then you have a second choice, which is high quality plus grays, which I find is very useful. That's 225 patches plus extended grays, so it goes to four sheets. And if you're doing any black and white, or even subtly toned prints that are better have relatively low saturation and lots of mid-tone transitions, that's a very useful choice. That gives you a really high level of quality, um, particularly in the mid-tones and the neutral tones. You can go to the Easy Expert Target. That's 729 patches. 
in my view, that can be thought to be overkill. Um, I have tried it both ways, and except on the most demanding images, I don't really see that much difference. It it takes for the two sheet to read the two sheets. It probably takes with a little bit of practice ten minutes. With the four sheets, it probably takes fifteen minutes. Those seven hundred and twenty nine patches take a while. Never mind the one that's on nine sheets. So you use that when you have to, but I wouldn't use it as a matter of routine. Now you can see right here, in fact, this is the same fellow I was talking about before. Here's a test target coming off his printer in his studio. So this is what the, this is what the screen looks like when you're reading them, but it's also pretty much what the test target looks like, except for this upper left-hand corner. And take note that, um, did I show you that before? But I will in a second. The software prints out what type of test you're doing, what the printer is, what paper you're using, and you input all this, of course. What rendering intent, ink set you're using, all this is on here for your record keeping. And the way that you read the patches is not that different than the way you read the patches using the colorimeter on your display, you, except that you put a piece of paper on an easel, and you slide the reader from right to left or left to right across each strip and the software will chime softly to let you know that you've read each strip correctly. Now, I'll give you a little tip about doing this. When you're reading these pages, I strongly suggest you take another sheet of the same paper and put it underneath because the light on this is so effective that it will actually burn through, shine through, I should say, a, a, a relatively, you know, a medium thickness sheet of paper, not maybe not the heaviest weight paper, but medium weight paper such as glossy or luster, and it'll pick up color from the underlying surface, such as this marble table. Actually, it might be granite underneath this table, and it will distort the readings that you get. So just take that extra sheet of paper and slide it underneath there and protect yourself. When you're going back and forth, um, you push the button down on the reader and slide smoothly across from left to right or right to left. Um, not too fast, not too slow. You'll get the hang of it pretty quick. When you're done, the process is complete. It's going to tell you that your profile has been created and saved. It's going to give it a name, et cetera, et cetera. And now you're going to be able to use it. I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. We, again, we have the spider proof view. You can look at before and after. You can see it says soft proof, slightly different screen, but same intent. You click this on and off, you're going to see before and after. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you use these profiles. We've got just enough time to do that. There's something that a lot of people don't know about um, simply because of the way it's named in Photoshop and also in Lightroom. It's called soft proofing. And in the main menu in Photoshop, you'll see it says View, and then Proof Setup, and then Custom. And the next screen is going to show us all the profiles that are present on the computer. And we're going to pick one of them, and that profile is going to be used to adjust what we see on the screen. And what's that going to do? It's going to give you a color accurate preview of what your print is going to look like when you make it on the printer. That's really important because you can start this right at the beginning of your editing session. And you can use that to help you predict what your edits are going to do to your image when you get to your final print. It's not as useful to turn this on right before you print. I tend to turn this on as I start an editing session so I can see what's happening with my images as I'm working. Very, very, very useful. I strongly encourage you to get these three things going. Calibrate your display, use your printer profiles, and use soft proofing to see what's going on. Now, if you click on custom, you get a drop down here and, and a drop down that says, sorry, a, 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 um, a palette, and a drop down menu, and you can see all of the, uh, well, a portion of the many, many profiles that are on my computer. And when you pick device to simulate, it's going to adjust the screen appropriately. Now, I picked two examples that are kind of extreme to show you what can happen. In the B panel, this is for plain paper, and you can see quite clearly that color saturation, everything has gone to heck in a handbasket here because it's not the right paper for this image. 
Nothing wrong with that. It's just a good example of what it's going to look like. On the upper left, it was set to a luster or glossy paper, and you can see there's a huge difference in the appearance between these two. And this drives home the point that you can see what's going to happen down the road if you enable this when you start your editing session. Now, when you go to print, I'm going to come back to Lightroom in a second. When you go to print, you also have a soft proofing or a color preview. It's sort of your last resort before you pull the trigger. If you enable, this is from CS6, if you enable match print colors, you will see this preview here on the screen. Printing with a profile, the color handling panel, of course you have to specify at the top that you're using the right printer. The color handling panel, you want to see application managed color or Photoshop manages colors. You don't want to see printer managed colors. Just remember that P brain is going to be in control of your life if you're running printer managed color. And you're going to specify that same printer profile. You're going to use that printer profile that you made. And you're going to use that to govern how the software sends its instructions to the printer so you get the result that you're looking for. Now, Lightroom 4. It's the first version of Lightroom that I've really gotten serious about, and I find myself, as somebody who's been doing digital photography for a long time, actually having to learn a mainstream application uh, all over again. I learned Lightroom 1 when it came out, but when I first, and Lightroom 2, uh, but I got very frustrated because it didn't have soft proofing. I couldn't see where I was going. It's kind of like shooting in the dark. And now in Lightroom 4, in the develop module, you can enable soft proofing by either clicking on this, or you can use a, a keystroke in Windows, it would be Control, and in, in Apple or Mac, it would be Command S. Okay. And you can enable soft proofing, and it will give you, if of course, you specify right here your profile. It says sRGB here, which is, which is uh, incorrect. What I should have here is the paper profile and the rendering intent. It will give you a color accurate preview of what things are going to look like when you're finished. And you can enable this right at the beginning, just like you can with Photoshop. And you can see what's happening step by step as you go forward so that you know what impact your edits are going to have and you get the result that you want, that your images sparkle from start to finish. Now, I'm going to back up a second. When you click on this profile button, again, you're going to see, actually, you're going to see two panels. You're going to see a short panel, and this one is short, and I'll, for a reason, I'll tell you why. If you click on other, you're going to get the big panel like you did in Photoshop. Any one of these where you click the little square and you click on include display profiles, they will now be here as a default in your first panel. You don't have to go hunting in this long list. You can pick the half dozen that you normally use. And they will pop up. And you can use those, backing up a second, you can use those to set your proof condition and see what's going on in all the aspects of your image. And of course, you can zoom in whatever you want, make your adjustments as you see fit, and know that that's what you're going to get when you get finished. Now, we're getting close to the end of our session. Color Manage Workflow. It looks complicated at first glance. What I would urge you to consider is that once you lock down your color and your procedures, you're in a position to control your color without a whole lot of effort. You're going to be in a position to um, not have to think about it too much. You're going to go from camera to display to print. And then you're going to be out where you really want to be, I think, in most cases, behind the camera. And, and so I urge you to go over this webinar again. It's going to be posted as a recording on the SPIDER website in a little while, a uh, few days. Go over it again and get started on locking down your color. If you only do one thing, I would suggest that you calibrate your display. Maybe get a SPIDER cube to help you um, normalize your color in a basic way. But down the road, you're going to find that you're going to want the nuance and the subtlety and the control that you get from devices like the spider print or the spider checker. Now, I also wanted to point out that there's a new setup, um, which is really quite nice, that was just announced by Data Color and the spider people. It's called Spider Capture Pro. 
it has the spider cube, the spider checker, and um, the spider four elite, and also a device um, called lens cow, which will help you normalize or control the point of focus of your DSLR lenses. Now that information is contained in another recorded webinar that's already up on the website. But if you want more information about this particular ensemble, you can go to the web address that's provided at the bottom of this page. Now, in conclusion, I want to point out that there's 20% of off all Spider products at the Spider website or datacolor.com through September 26th, and the promo code is color20, lowercase. Our winner of a Spider 4 Pro is Susan Graham. Susan, we're going to be sending you email instructions uh, asking you for your shipping information, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I haven't really seen any questions come through on the question panel. I'm wondering if anybody has any questions that I can answer at this stage. So far, I don't see anything. I would also encourage you um, to send in suggestions for topics. Uh, we have an email address called webinars at datacolor.com. That's webinars at datacolor.com. If you want to see different topics covered, uh, for example, we did a, a specialty topic last week on fine art reproduction. That's, I think, already been posted to the website. If it's not, it will be in a day or so. And we're planning more specialty sessions as we go forward. We're going to be covering the basics. Uh, we'll be repeating things like this. Uh, late, for example, this one's going to be repeated later today. You're welcome to attend. You can sign up for two if you want to. Um, and if you have suggestions for the future topics that you would like us to cover, suggestions, things like that, please do send us an email. Um, again, my name, let me just switch over here, is David Saffer. I want to thank our sponsor, Data Color, for all their support in putting these webinars together. I think they really help photographers. If you want to get in touch with me with a specialty question, my email is dsaffer at mac.com. I really do try to answer those emails. If you don't get an answer from me back in 24 hours, please do send the email to me again. I get a lot of emails. Sometimes I miss them. I have a blog which has a lot of content. I've let it lay fallow during the month of August. I kind of take a vacation from the blog in August. It's kind of a slow period. But it's going to be picking up again, and there's a lot of content from, from past postings. It's davidsaffer.wordpress.com. Um, David Toby, my partner in this, also has an excellent WordPress blog at cdtoby.wordpress.com. I want to thank you all for your time and attention. I hope that you come back for subsequent webinars. And uh, have a great week. Bye-bye for now.